Good afternoon, everyone. For those who don't know me, I am Corrine Sinqui. I'm the pediatric hematologist oncologist. But before I start, I'd like to recognize Dr. Patrick Roberts. And Dr. Roberts, can I ask you to stand so people will know who I'm speaking of? And Dr. Patrick Roberts is indeed my mentor, and I could say that he is the, the father, the grandfather of, of promotion of sickle cell disease awareness in this country. So thank you for coming. Okay. I decided to take a slightly different approach for today since we have three speakers. And I know we had a seminar sometime last year where we went through a lot of the details on sickle cell disease. So today I decided that we will just concentrate more on just a brief overview, talking about some of the statistics, inheritance, signs and symptoms, and complications. And I really wanted to spend special time on two complications, acute chest syndrome and stroke. Next slide. Okay. So for those of you who did biology, you will be able to recognize this. So this is a normal blood vessel with a normal flowing red cells. And the red cells are nice and round. They're just discs. And these small discs can maneuver the blood vessels and the blood pipes very easily. They're flexible. No issues with carrying the oxygen and the nutrients to the, to, the, to, the, to the tissue. Next slide. This is a slide showing sickle cells. And it is amazing that a small mutation on one of the globin chains for the hemoglobin could result in such drastic changes. And what happens in sickle cell disease is that when it is exposed, when the red cells are exposed to a little bit of lowered oxygen tension, they polymerize. And for the most part, it's a bit reversible. But if it happens too often, then it becomes permanent. And the sickle cells, but the sickle cells now are distorted in shape. And they tend to be rigid. That one? OK. So they tend to be rigid. They can't maneuver the blood vessels very well. They stack up, and they block the blood vessels. And this is what ends up causing the pain because it, the blood supply to the distal tissue is interfered with. And these cells are also destroyed a lot more rapidly than the normal red cells. And the lifespan for these cells are about 20 days compared to 120 days for normal cells. So this is how can we get the chronic anemia. Next slide. Danielle mentioned some of the statistics for a study that Dr. Patrick Roberts had done years ago, and more recently, Dr. Deshawn Ferguson actually completed a study for her thesis. It's unpublished, but it did document a frequency of the sickle cell trait of 8.4% in the, in the mothers during the period of, of a six-month period. And we also look at it and compare the rate that is in Jamaica. So it's slightly less than the one in Jamaica. And, to, and just to let you see that in Africa, we have rates of up to 40%, and in India, 22%. So it's very variable across the world. The rate of new cases at birth was one in 685 for this study. And it was a limited study, so it may, in fact, be um, different in the long run when we do a bigger study. And this definitely is less than what we see in Jamaica. Next slide. So here is the inheritance. We'll just talk about one possibility where you have two parents, one with a sickle cell trait, AS, one with a sickle cell trait, AS. Together, they can have four possibilities because half of the genes come from the mother, half of the genes come from the father. They can have a child that is completely normal, AA. 50% of the children can have sickle cell trait, 25%, one in four can have the sickle cell disease, the SS type. Now, there are other types of sickle cell disease. You have SC, SD Punjab, SO Arab, S beta thalassemia, but by far the commonest type is the SS variety. And I want to just remind you that this is the risk of having a child with sickle cell disease for each pregnancy. It's not that you have one child with sickle cell disease, that means the next three can't have sickle cell disease. That's not how this works. It's like throwing the dice. Next slide. So the key features for sickle cell disease is the anemia that we talked about because of the early death of the, sick, of the sickle cells. 
as a byproduct from the hemoglobin that is released, you will get the jaundice. And oftentimes, the organs are trying to make extra cells. And you have large livers, large spleens. And the heart, I put there, because not uncommonly, you have a flow murmur because of the low hemoglobin, the anemia. Next slide. Then we talk about the complications, OK? And I'm sure that for those of you who are in the audience who have sickle cell disease can attest to some of these issues that we see. Vasoocclusive crisis or painful crisis is reported in up to 70% of patients. And I'm sure that in this audience, for those who have sickle cell disease, all of you could say that you have had a painful crisis. Gallstones. By the time you are adults, 70% of patients will have gallstones. Now, it doesn't mean that they are all symptomatic. It doesn't mean that it all cause problems. But definitely, we will be able to detect gallstones on just about all the sickle cell patients during adulthood. Acute chest, 40%. Blindness, more commonly seen in the patients with SC variety than the SS type, but definitely is a problem. Aplastic crisis, and that is where the bone marrow that produces the red cells shut down for a while. A third of patients will have aplastic crisis sometimes throughout their lifetime. Prior prism, and that is unwanted erection. I know erection is supposed to be joyful, not this one. Okay, this one is painful. Up to 40% of these patients will have experienced prior prism. Stroke, more commonly seen in children, 10% of the population of children. Then you have things like avascular necrosis. So patients with sickle cell disease can have problems with their joints. So you have problems with the shoulders and the hips, can't walk as well, can't extend the joints as well as you used to, and definitely associated with pain. Leg ulcers, more commonly seen in the adult patients, 20%. And as we go on in life, we find that some of the organs, like the kidney, is also damaged, up to 20%. Now, the life expectancy is increasing with better and better treatment. So where people would say that a lot of patients with sickle cell disease would die early, that is not what we are seeing now. But is it as normal as a regular population? The answer is not quite, okay? So we do need to take some precautions in making sure that we, we get as good a life span as possible. Next slide. So I said that I would want to concentrate, and this is why I kind of hurried through some of the other slides to try and get to the two important ones that I want to talk, to, uh, talk about today. The first one is acute chest syndrome, and this is a long-related complication for sickle cell disease, and in this problem, you have a lowered oxygen for the body, and the hemoglobin also falls a little bit lower than the usual baseline anemia. Repeat occurrences of acute chest syndrome can lead to permanent damage of the lungs. It's much more common in young children, but definitely when the adults get it, it's oftentimes more severe and maybe fatal. Next slide. So what are the symptoms that you would want to watch for? Cough. Wheezing, chest pain, fever, shortness of breath. And I bring particular attention to the kind of sim the signs you would want to look for when you are assessing whether or not you think you can wait it out. Breathing fast, pulling in between the ribs, pulling in here at the top. And when you go home today, look again at family member and see if you can see any pulling in in these areas. Probably not. So you know now that if you see those kind of symptoms, breathing fast and these what we call retractions, then you know that this is not the time to wait it out. You need to carry the child in. Flaring of the nostrils. These are all attempts of the body to try and open up the, the, the lungs and get as much air into the lungs and as much oxygen. 
And I put grunting as a sign. And what we mean by grunting? <coughs> 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 okay? Not a good sign. And sometimes when you see them, you may not hear anything else on the chest. You don't hear any of the crackles that you would expect to hear. But you see these signs. The fast breathing. The pulling in between the ribs. The flaring of the nostrils and the grunting. Next slide. Great caution and respect is what I would say I have for this. Okay, I think it's one of the most humbling things in sickle cell disease management. The symptoms might be mild, but the progression can be very, very rapid and can even lead to death. Sometimes you might be able to wait it out and watch it as an outpatient but oftentimes, these patients require hospitalization. And depending on how severe they are, you might need to get them admitted to the intensive care unit. Next slide. So this is the changes that you can see in the chest x-ray. And we mentioned the signs and symptoms before. So cough, wheezing, fever, shortness of breath. Plus new changes on chest x-ray gives you the diagnosis of acute chest syndrome. Now really they try to, to change the name and call it acute chest syndrome and not pneumonia. Because if you say pneumonia, that's infection. Just treat that with antibiotics. It's not just pneumonia. It's more than pneumonia. And it is really to try and alert us that the management for acute chest syndrome is not just antibiotics. So here is an almost normal chest x-ray where the lung fields are black. And the only part that you see that is white is the heart, the middle part. On this middle x-ray, you see an area in the lung that is white that should have been black. Okay, so this is a new infiltrate for this patient. We're dealing with acute chest syndrome, and if they have the signs and symptoms before, then great caution, you need to treat them aggressively. And I want you to understand that this progression to an almost white out of the chest, where the patient is now breathing on only about a quarter of the lung that they should normally be breathing on, can happen within hours. So the change from here to here can be rapid. And they can die. So you need to be on the alert that this is not something. And in fact, recently I managed a patient. And I remember saying, you know, um, you know, I really don't like doing acute chest syndrome at home. But she didn't look too bad. So we said, OK, I'll, I'll work with you. I need you to bring her back tomorrow. So tomorrow she came back and she looked about the same, if not a little bit better. She said she felt a little bit better. And I said, you know, I'm still very nervous for her. The x-ray didn't show any great progression. And we said, okay, we'll wait it out a little bit more, one more day. I gave her a prescription for something for the pharmacy. And in leaving the office to the pharmacy, and about half an hour later, she called in a panic. All of the things you told me to watch for is happening. I'm taking her straight to the hospital now. And sure enough, we had rapid progression in findings. And I know that those parents learned great respect for acute chest syndrome. And I'm not saying that all patients need to be hospitalized. But I want you to understand that this is not something that you must take lightly. Next slide. A lot of you in here with sickle cell disease, probably even some of you who don't have sickle cell disease, may have had this kind of device placed on their finger. And it is a device to try and give us an estimate of what your oxygen is. The normal reading here should be over 95%. So I mentioned earlier that acute chest syndrome is associated with a lower oxygen in the body. So we expect then that the O2 sat which is an objective measure, is going to be low. And if you go to the doctor with cough, fever, even before you do the chest x-ray, and that O2 sat is low, you know that you're probably dealing with acute chest syndrome. And it's not just a simple viral upper respiratory tract infection. You have to be very careful and cautious. The hemoglobin level is often lowered, not by too much. The white count might be elevated, and blood culture 
we'll talk about in the next slide. Next. So some of the causes. I put infection there at the top, but oftentimes we never grow anything. So we know that it is probably not infection. And with the rapidity with which we see the symptoms and signs progress, we probably know that it is not infection. And it might be more infarction from the sickling process or embolism from fat and bone marrow. And I draw attention to this, atelectasis. When patients come in with pain, pain in the chest, pain in the back especially, pain in the abdomen, what do we do? <coughs> you breathe kind of shallow, you try and brace yourself and you know, you, you, the, 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 the amount of effort to breathe deeply makes it uncomfortable. As a result, you can get some atelectasis, and as a result of that, you can get the progression of acute chest. So, poor respiratory effort, and you know, we give you pain medicine to help you with the pain that you're having. But unfortunately, sometimes that helps to decrease your effort. So because you're kind of sleepy and drowsy, you don't breathe as deeply, and that alone can help to contribute to atelectasis too. And patients who go in for operations with general anesthesia, who I think Dr. Knows will talk about, that this also predisposes them to getting acute chest syndrome. Next slide. So then the treatment, we talked about some of the complications and the problems with it. Clearly oxygen is a plus. Fluids, we've always taught you that fluids to help to keep them well hydrated, to decrease some of the sickling and the blockage that you can get would be helpful. Pain medicines are must. Antibiotics, we give it to you, you know, because we know that some cases are associated with infection, but we don't know which ones those are going to be. So we throw that on board too, and again, because we want to give you everything we can give you early to try and change the course of the, the progression. Patients oftentimes need a blood transfusion, and this blood transfusion can be a simple blood transfusion, or we may elect to exchange it, give you blood and take out blood, give you blood and take out blood to lower the amount of sickling that is occurring and hopefully decrease the progression. And I left this last. This machine is called an incentive spirometer, and this is something I think every sickle cell patient should have. Every sickle cell patient should have and they should use it and work on it so that they know when they're well, how good an effort they can make in making this thing move, okay? This thing moves and then this thing moves, okay? Because when you're sick, I want you to know that is what you have to aim to do because this machine is probably going to be as important, if not more important than the antibiotics and the pain medicine in making you recover. Next slide. Prevention. This, in fact, is a slide that says to you that patients who have had three or more episodes of acute chest syndrome or acute painful sickle cell crisis in the previous year could benefit from going on hydroxyurea. And hydroxyurea is, is a medication that would probably be one of the greatest contributions that we have made in the treatment of sickle cell disease, say in the 80s, 90s. And the addition of hydroxyurea on a daily basis has actually made a big difference to the quality of life for a lot of sickle cell patients. And this medication is actually originally a chemotherapy agent that we use for the treatment of cancer and by accident or by research, we found out that there is a benefit in the production of hemoglobin F. I didn't go through the hemoglobin, different hemoglobin, but just suffice it to say that the hemoglobin F actually helps to prevent the sickling. So using this could help to minimize the amount of serious complications from sickle cell disease. However, chemotherapy, side effects. So you have to monitor, especially for lowered white counts, 
and it can also affect liver and kidneys as well. So we do need to monitor you. But I could say that the verdict is out that you can have patients who are on hydroxyurea for many, 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 many years. And if you ask some of the ones who have benefited from it to stop, they'll probably say, no way. Okay? Next slide. Caution again. Acute chest syndrome is potentially life-threatening, can lead to respiratory failure and death, and in fact is the leading cause of death among patients with sickle cell disease. Next slide. So the next one I want to talk about is stroke. So by the age of 18 years, overt stroke would have been seen in about 11% of the children. However, it can occur in adulthood as well. And of interest, once you have had a stroke, the likelihood for you to get another stroke within the next three to five years is over 60%. Okay? High. Okay? Not good. Next slide. So what are the signs of stroke? The same as in stroke from any other reason, okay? Sudden weakness or numbness of the face, arm, or leg. Sudden confusion, trouble speaking or understanding. Trouble walking, dizziness, loss of balance or coordination. Sudden severe headaches with un no known cause. Next slide. So the management. Not uncommonly, patients coming in with a stroke get a CAT scan of the head. All right, we want to see where in the brain may be affected. But if you come in early, within hours of the stroke, we really only look in to see if there's a bleed because we sometimes won't be able to see the area of infarction, the area where you have a little blockage to the brain. And oftentimes, you may even need to repeat it within about three to four days to see the involvement. MRI would be a little bit more sensitive but definitely much more expensive. It, it, you know, because we have to sedate the patients to go to MRI for children, it costs twice as much doing MRIs in children than it does in adults. So the recommendation is the CT scan of the head. No contrast. I want to emphasize no contrast to all of you. I want you to make sure that if anybody wants to do a CT scan for any reason whatsoever, that they think three and four times about it because the contrast agent can actually cause you to get dehydrated. And if you get dehydrated, then you can go into crisis. So you want them to be conscious of that. You want them to hydrate you first. You want them to hydrate you afterwards. You want to make sure that your kidney is flushing well so that it can get rid of the dye safely. For what we're looking for on the CT in stroke, we don't need contrast. Blood transfusion I mentioned for acute chest. Again, an important tool for us. And we do exchange transfusion because we're trying to definitely change the amount of sickling and the amount of obstruction that is there to prevent an uh, advanced area of infarction to the brain. Aspirin. Now, aspirin they use in adults, and it's, it's a little bit controversial whether or not aspirin is of benefit. But I see where more and more people are considering it, and so I would say that definitely something for consideration. Now, you know from past that in the adults they say get to the hospital get to the hospital within four hours of a stroke get to the hospital in the adults and why is that because they can do something about the stroke by giving you the clot buster no clot buster here though okay it doesn't work here so the treatment is really IV fluids blood transfusion and just wait to see the recovery next slide but beyond that admission, we need to do things. Remember I said to you that there's a two-third chance that they will get another stroke. If we do nothing more, there's a two-third chance that they'll get another stroke within three to five years of the first stroke. So this is an indication for monthly transfusion therapy to reduce the risk. 
some will say, well, then if it is three to five years, then we cover them for three to five years. That should be fine. Unfortunately, when we stop after three to five years, the risk goes back to two thirds for the next three to five years. So lifelong transfusion therapy is probably what is needed for strokes. After about two years of transfusion, not a problem again. The amount of iron that is in blood now becomes another issue because iron will deposit in organs like the liver, the heart, the brain. So iron is not a good thing. And so after about two years of being on a transfusion protocol, you need to do chelation therapy. And that comes with its own problems and its own cost. Bone marrow transplantation, definitely a consideration. And stem cell transplantation. Also, I would say to you that if you have a child who has had sickle cell disease, even if for nothing else, if you have any other children, make arrangements to do cord blood banking so that in case that child or the other child with a sickle cell disease could benefit from the transplantation, that might be a possibility. And then I put here gene therapy, which is still in evolution, and hopefully one day we'll be able to, to actually manipulate the genes and it will be an easier route for curing sickle cell disease. Next slide. I put this here because I have not been doing this over the years. And the reason I have not been doing this procedure, I'm sorry that this is a, it is an adult patient because um, you know, I, I, liked, I would have liked it for it to have been a child, but this one was the picture that I thought was the one that helped me to let you know what they're doing. So this is the ultrasound probe, and all they're doing is doing an ultrasound right around the area here, and it's called transcranial Doppler. So they're checking for the flow of blood, the velocity of flow of blood in the vessels around that area. And what they found out is that we can predict which patients are going to get a stroke by virtue of the velocity. So if it is abnormal, greater than 200 centimeters per second, there's a 40% risk for a stroke within three years. Now I have to openly confess that I have not been doing this even though this is knowledge that we knew from a while. And the reason for that is that I can't get the patients who need to go on a transfusion, who have a stroke, much more to tell the person that you might get a stroke and I need you to come every month to get a transfusion and this is just a maybe a 50% chance it might happen and that in two years time I need you to go on chelation therapy because this is all to help you from not getting the stroke. I didn't think I was that good a salesperson. Uh, so, you know, maybe I, and I do, I do confess that this is something that I probably did not educate all of my patients well enough on because there might have been ones who might have wanted to do it, okay? However, what we know is that in the Twitch trial in 2016, they were actually able to demonstrate that in these same patients with abnormal TCD velocity, we can give them hydrea. That's a pill. That's a pill you could take. I could sell that. I could sell that. And not only could I sell it as a pill to take, it actually is on the drug plan. So if I put your name on an NIB drug plan, it is free. Okay? So no reason for you to not do it. So I am going to be in negotiation with the radiology department to try and get this initiated within the next several months and to do it on a regular basis for all the patients and to screen the ones that are already in the system. So the screening will actually start from the age of two to about 18. Next slide. So screening, you know, screening tests can be done as early as 16, nine to 10 weeks of pregnancy with a chorionic villus sampling uh, and amniocentesis at 16 to 18 weeks. Both of them are invasive procedures that might be associated with a small risk for miscarriage. However, just to mention that you can know if the child you're carrying has sickle cell before the child is born. 
most of us will end up doing newborn screening. So at around the time of birth, you can just do a heel prick, put it on a little card, send it off, and do lots of different tests, including sickle cell, to detect whether or not they have sickle cell disease. Routinely, in the pediatric clinic, we check for anemia, not necessarily for sickle cell anemia, because a lot of them are more iron deficiency anemia, but definitely at around the age of one, we will check for the sickle cell prep around that time and to check the hemoglobin and the anemia level. So we have another opportunity to pick up some that may have been missed. Unfortunately, newborn screening is not routine in the Bahamas. Hopefully, we will get to there soon. During pregnancy, for those of you who have a child will know that you do get routinely screened for sickle cell disease. However, Dr. Ferguson Saunders did report that even though we do the screening, we don't do as much the education that comes with the screening. And so don't tell them that if you have sickle cell trait, there's a chance that you could have a child with sickle cell disease. We need to follow through on that. And oftentimes, you will get screened before they put you to sleep to check and see if you might have sickle cell disease. Confirmation is a blood test for hemoglobin electrophoresis. Next slide. I leave this here. Now the HIV said, know your status. <laughs> so I leave this here for you to know your status. Because think about it. If we could get the passports done that documents your, your sickle cell status, you only need to do it once. You don't need to do it twice. You only need to do it once. Not like HIV where it could be negative today and positive in a month's time, right? But the sickle cell disease screening test, we can do and you can know your status. If you know you have the sickle cell trait, then if your partner has a sickle cell trait too, you know that there's a risk, and you will know the calculated risk and the percentage of possibility for your child to have sickle cell disease. And then you can make whatever wise choices at that point for how you carry on with your families. Thank you very much. OK, good evening. Well, Dr. Sinkri did the hardest job because <laughs> she gave a good overview. Uh, so some of the terms that I'll speak about you, you would already have gone through it in her presentation. Okay, I guess you're asking what a surgeon has to do with sickle cell disease. Uh, actually, we have a lot to do with sickle cell disease. Uh, me and Dr. Sinkri work, along, work a lot together because the sicklers, there are a lot of indications for surgery with sicklers. And even if they're coming in for other surgeries, are not related to an indication for surgery, we still have to get involved. So the surgical team, the hematologist, and the anesthetist. So if one thing you get from this lecture is that it's a multidisciplinary approach uh, when these kids present for surgery. Okay, so as an approach, I'll pretty much speak about just the indications for surgery and then the perioperative management, which is the main thrust of this talk. And when we say perioperative management, that means what you're gonna do before surgery, what we're gonna do during surgery, and then after surgery, okay? So that's pre, intra, and post-operative. But that, the whole realm is perioperative management. So, I must say it and say it and say it. So sickle cell disease is associated with an increased risk of a lot of complications. So which can be decreased by, by the end of this talk, a multidisciplinary approach. So surgeon, hematologist, anesthetist. Okay, so common indications. One is splenectomy. We'll speak about that. I don't know if you guys know what the spleen is. I know most of you cyclists know what the spleen is. You've probably had a splenic crisis where you have sickling of the cells and a sequester in the spleen, and it's very painful. And the, one of the things that happens is it drops your hemoglobin. So that's a real challenge, uh, so we'll speak about that. The, probably the most common operation we do for sickle cell disease is cholecystectomy. That's taking out your gallbladder for gallstones, as Dr. Sinkwe alluded to. And then hip replacement, Dr. Sinkwe also alluded to the avascular necrosis, which you can get, and later in life you may need hip replacement. And then other surgeries is any other surgeries. If you have colon cancer, thyroid disease, there's a certain approach you have to adhere to with patients with sickle cell. Okay, so let's speak about spinectomy. So the one thing 
that you see a lot is the acute splenic sequestration crisis. And I'm sure some of you are sicklers here. You've probably been admitted with, with, with this sequestration crisis. Uh, another indication is hypersplenism. That's a bit different than crisis. That's basically, you have a hyperactive spleen. So your platelets, these are one of the blood lines, they drop, your hemoglobin drops, and your white cell drop. Uh, another indication for surgery in cyclists is splenic abscess. So abscess is just infection with a lot of pus. So you have a spleen that's full with pus. You could have a massive splenic infarction, meaning that that area of the spleen, just like a heart attack, you basically have a heart attack, well, a heart attack of the spleen. Uh, we do a lot of splenectomies in, well, before we get to that, we all, we always learn and we speak about it as a medical student. Well, uh, adults shouldn't have a spleen because you have basically auto uh, splenectomy. But we do see a lot of older children and young adults with spleens with these complications. But just to know, in kids, splenectomy is safe. It reduces, and this is the most important thing right here, it reduces the patient's transfusion requirements, eliminating, eliminating the risk of this acute splenic sequestration. And pretty much since I've been back in two years, we've done two or three for this indication. And then it eliminates the discomfort and mechanical pressure of the enlarged spleen. Oh, sorry. Okay, so cholecystectomy. This is the most common operation we do f for patients with, with galls, with, uh, well, gallstones and patients with sickle cell disease. Up to 70%, as Dr. Sinkri said, of patients may have uh, gallstones. Not, that doesn't mean it's symptomatic, but up to 70% of them will have gallstones. And it's not the gallstones you see in your well, students would know the four F's, the 40 fat, right. So these aren't the cholesterol stones, these are the pigmented stones. And it's secondary to hemolysis, as Dr. Senke was speaking about. So it's really not the gallstones that cause the problem. It was the complications. One is acute cholecystitis, so you have inflammation of the gallbladder, and that can cause pus to come in the, the, the gallbladder, giving you empyema, and it can perforate. You can have pancreatitis, which is very severe. Those little stones can get into pancreatic duct, and you get inflammation of the pancreas, and that's, that can be very se severe. Up to, I would say up to 5% of patients can die from acute pancreatitis, especially if it's severe. And then the, the big one we want to avoid is the acute cholangitis, is that that can be very, very deadly. Okay, so there's a question we always speak about, and this will, I guess for the students, we'll access in the, in the exam. Should a cholecystectomy be performed the same time as you do a splenectomy in children? And the answer is yes. So they've, they did big studies, and it shows with good perioperative management, cholecystectomy and splenectomy is both safe and effective in children with sickle cell disease. So if you have a patient who's coming with acute splenic sequestration, recurrent, and has gallstones, most likely we'll take out both at the same time. And we could do it now laparoscopically, uh, so not open surgery. Uh, so patients can get out of hospital. If we do it laparoscopically today, in two days, they can be discharged from hospital as opposed to five to seven days as previous. But as you can see, evidence, good study done that shows that it's safe. So when we talk about perioperative management, which is really the crux of this talk, it's really, really important. We know that the morbidity is high with patients with sickle cell disease, and the mortality is higher than the normal person. And again, I know you guys are tired of it, multi-disciplinary approach. Okay, so what do we do? So say you have gallstones secondary to, to because of your sickle cell disease, how do we get these patients ready for surgery? So the first thing we do, well, the first thing I do, is call Dr. Sinqui. <laughs> or she calls me, either way, to say there's this patient who's coming in for cholecystectomy, is gonna be admitted. We, as her team, they'll be admitting our service and they want to consult and also want the anesthetist to see prior to surgery. Now where I trained, they used to have us, and I'm sure Dr. Sinqui in our training would have had the same. They had a sickle cell team 
So you had a team separate from, well, it involved the different doctors, but you had a specific team. Once you identified that that patient had to have surgery, they were informed and they came in and they did most of the work. Uh, so no, so there's nothing, you know, nothing left untouched. So we kind of, we adhere to pretty much the protocol worldwide. So we admit these patients 12 to 24 hours. And as Dr. Sinkwe said, first thing you do, we want to get them hydrated. Uh, we perform pulmonary function tests to, to treat any obstructive disease with a bronchodilator. That's preoperatively. Uh, and also, one of the things we do as well is we get the incentive spirometer and we start that preoperatively. And that, I'll speak about it, studies have shown that that's helped with the post-op pulmonary complications that you have less. Uh, this is debatable as far as pre-op blood transfusion. We know in the Caribbean, our blood banks are a bit depleted. So the standards in North America, they like to get the, eight, the hemoglobin up to 9 to 11, which if you look at the hem hematocrit, it's just three times the hemoglobin. So they want it between 9 or 11 or 30. But that, that is a challenge for us. And um, you'll have some anesthetists that hard and fast. You have to have the HB at 10, but some who are more experienced um, and knowing the circumstances, we can get away with maybe an 8 sometimes, but knowing that there is associated, an associated uh, increase in morbidity. But I'll speak about a, a, a paper that came out of Jamaica where they, it was a small cohort, only 30 patients, not a big paper, but they showed even keeping the HB about eight, they were able to basically have the same amount of morbidity as in North America. And I'll speak, I'll show you that study. Uh, but when, we do, when we're doing minor procedures, we're not that fussed about, about the hemoglobin. But take home message for the students, you want an HB for your USMLE exams? at 10, okay, preoperatively. So intra-op. So there's no real specific anesthetic technique, so it's the same anesthesia as we do for any other surgery. Hydration, that's most important. So in that IV line, you have to be hydrated. Pre-oxygenation, very important. So you've given fluid, and you're making sure the cells are oxygenated. You're monitoring the oxygen with the same Little thing that Dr. Sinkwe showed you, the pulse oximetry. Again, you're trying to prevent hypothermia as well. Because what you want to prevent is you, want, you don't want to have sickling. Because if you have sickling, that will cause complications. Again, you position the patient in a certain way to prevent venous stasis. We already know they are at increased risk of venous ulcers, as Dr. Sinkwe has said. And we monitor the blood loss and replace the blood, blood as necessary. This is important too, the intraoperative, this, the one thing the anesthetist has to do at all times is look at that O2 sat monitoring. And as Dr. Sinkri say, you wanna make sure that's within above 94 because intraop desaturation may cause postoperative acute chest syndrome. And that's been shown by many studies. Okay. So just, so that's what we do while you guys are asleep this is what we make sure happens. <laughs> now, post-op, this is probably, this is where we have the most challenge, I would say. Once you've had your surgery, you've come out to recovery, we make sure that still, that pulse oximetry is still on until the, per, the patient is awake. Fluids, 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 you continue giving the fluids. Um, early, in center spirometry, which decreases the incidence of pulmonary complications. But we've started to even do it preoperatively. But most of the studies, they would use it as they get into recovery and as they wake up, they start the, the, with the incentive spirometer. In the perfect world, we'd like to have all these patients go to ICU. But we know we're in the Caribbean, there are only so much ICU beds. So that's, that's a challenge as well. So if we can't get them in ICU, we do make sure that the team round the clock are watching these patients. The HDU is a high dependency unit, or as doctors have an IMCU. At the Princess Margaret Hospital, we don't have that step down, but 
doctor's hospital does have an IMCU. So if these patients are operated on at doctor's hospital, they all go to IMCU post-op. Uh, overnight observation, consider they all stay overnight. Um, one thing is acute chest syndrome peaks at 48 hours. So you want to keep these patients, especially when you do a major surgery, at least two days because you, you've got to anticipate the issue. Even if you've done this laparoscopic splenectomy, everything's gone good, you have to know that there's a risk of acute chest, so we tend to keep them in about, that's why I said earlier, about two days. Analgesia is, as sicklers will know, that's very important, pain management. And of course, we all know when you have sickle cell disease, your pain tolerance, you know, right, and your response to, to the narcotics, to opiates, which you can give me to make, it's not the same for you guys. So we have to titrate that. Some patients get, the, uh, well, we have to titrate it and we have to monitor them. Because of course, the risk with narcotics is you can have respiratory depression. So we have to keep an eye on that. And with any surgery, th thromboprophylaxis. Again, it goes right with the stroke thing and the sickling and the blood, the viscosity. They're at risk of blood clots to the leg and the chest. So we have to give them prophylaxis anticoagulation. And then, of course, as all the sicklers will know, you get your penicillin V, your folic acid, and any other medication <coughs> that you're on. Okay, so this, this, this is a bit, and I'm sure Dr. Sink will speak to this, this is a bit of a controversy, controversial area. Sh should you be aggressive and exchange, transfuse these patients, or simply do simple transfusion up to 10. As Dr. Sinqui said, with extraneous transfusion, what you do is you're trying to remove the sickle blood and put in normal blood. And the initial aggressive guys were basically trying to do uh, extraneous transfusion to get less than 30% of sickle or that S, that sickle red blood cell within the circulation. And they felt when they did that, the morbidity of the surgery was less. Okay, so that's, that's how they felt. However, there's a big study in the New England Journal of Medicine that compared conservative versus aggressive. So conservative is just topping you up with blood. Aggressive is exchange transfusion. And their conclusion was a conservative transfusion regimen is as effective as an aggressive regimen. And the one thing is you have less transfusion-related complications so students, if you ask this in exam, this is what you say. And this is why. You don't want to be so aggressive, increasing the morbidity. Okay? And this is the evidence. This is a big journal, New England Journal of Medicine. Okay. As I spoke, s s referred to earlier, there was a paper that was done in Jamaica. Uh, and of course, you know, blood bank being depleted, we really can't get all these patients up to 10. So they were hovering around eight, or at least the patients were two grams above their steady state. So if their steady state was five, you get them to seven, six, you get them to eight. And what they found with this sel selective transfusion, the morbidity was acceptable, and there were no perioperative mortalities. It was just one problem with this paper. It was only 29 patients. So this, the, it was in the weight, uh, and it was post, it was, uh, it was in, it was a retrospective, not a type one evidence. But it did show that in this uh, cohort that you could get away just, you know, being a bit more conservative. So basically, again, I'll end as I started. It's a multidisciplinary team. There's no patient who's, who I'll ever operate on with sickle cell disease without speaking to Dr. Sinqui, Dr. Curling, or Dr. Turnquist. It's just not going to happen. There's no patient that will be operated on with sickle cell disease who doesn't see the anesthetist preoperatively. There's no patient with sickle cell disease who won't have that same incentive spirometer right by their bed. And then we finish cooperation. So medical team, which is the hematologist, the anesthetic team, and the surgical team. And that's it. I'm going to talk about something that 
you know, most of the women, and the men in here would want to know, especially um, ones who are sickle cell. And that's sickle cell disease and pregnancy. Um, it's a big deal because, uh, you know, as sicklers are growing and getting and having a much longer life expectancy, people want to get pregnant, all right? And what's happening is that what we're saying as physician is ch physicians are changing, okay? Next slide. I got, oh, oh I can use this. The bottom one. All right. All right. So one of the things we just talk about just briefly is what happens to our blood, to our blood supply, not our, what happens to a woman's blood supply when <laughs> <laughs> because I'm never going to experience this, so, all right. Well, <laughs> one of the things that happens is the amount of plasma that they have, so the amount of liquid you have in your blood actually increases, and it increases a lot, all right? The other thing is there's actually an increase in the number of circulating red cells. That'll actually come in a test in a sneaky way. Um, so it turns out that people are getting a little anemic, but the actual number of red cells actually increase. It's just that the plasma volume, this for the medical students, increases more than, than um, the uh, red cell numbers do. And there's actually an increase in the ability to, to clot. Well, why is that? Well, you know, at the end of this whole period, there's going to be an episode where you're going to get massive hemorrhage, and the body needs to get ready to stop that very quickly, because you don't want people to bleed out. So what really is the issue, all right? And the issue, quite simply, is in the 1980s, there were several studies that were published. And what they sh basically showed, or what they suggested is, is that basically among sicklers, the rate of abortions, spontaneous abortions, was about 19%. The rate of stillbirths were about 21%. The rate of premature labor, 32%. And the rate of having kids small for gestational age was about 42 percent. Now you can imagine if you're an obstetrician and you have this female patient and she's a sickler and she says I want to be I want to get pregnant and have a baby and you're seeing this in your literature you're just going oh <laughs> somebody else got to do this because this look like this could be a problem all right and a big problem and so a lot of obstetricians and hematologists sort of started Read, read the literature and started to make recommendations based on that, okay? And if you have an obstetrician who were trained in the 80s, which most of the really good guys right now, <laughs> this is when they were in medical school or in training, um, this is what they've come to believe is dogma. This is what it was. So that's some of the responses that people get when they talk to the older obstetricians and gynecologists about having kids, uh, sicklers. So what happened? So in the late 80s, they did more studies and they said, okay, well maybe we can actually improve the amount of these complications. Why don't we just give everybody blood, but we'll give it to them before they start having problems, right? That seems to make sense, right? So the whole dilutional thing with sickle cell just give them blood and give it to them on a monthly basis and therefore the percentage of sickle cells will go down and that, you know, makes, that would help. The other thing though is why don't we improve the prenatal care? Get people in, get them on the right medications, do all the things that we need, that we need to do. Because unfortunately one of the problems with the earlier studies is they took all comers from third world countries where prenatal care was not really that great, right? And so if you include 20 or 30 percent of people who had no prenatal care, then of course the numbers are going to look crappy, okay? And then the third thing is, so let's do a better job in identifying people who already have problems before they get pregnant. So the organ dysfunction. So you, you've heard Dr. Sinkby and Dr. Knowles talk about kidney involvement, lung involvement, heart issues, the like. Well, let's identify that up front and see you know, who are, who are going to be, be the people that are going to do good and who are going to be people who are not going to do good. All right? And so if you actually started to um, put all these three things together, what they found is, is that when these changes happen, the patients with sickle cell usually tolerated their pregnancy without any difference in major morbidity with them or their babies. So just do a better job in picking out people. And maybe not maybe, let's give them transfusions, right? Well, 
this is like everything else in medicine. The more we study something, the more, better we get at it. Then we kind of change our talks a little bit, which frustrates the hell out of everybody. But, you know, we keep looking at the issue and sort of picking out who's going to do good and who's not going to do good. All right, so this is actually an updated table on the complications from uh, people with sickle cell, all right? So, maternal complications. Preeclampsia, about 14%. Now, I don't know what the preeclampsia rate is in our obstetrics um, unit here, but we got a lot of really big women who have high blood pressure going in anyhow. So, <laughs> I don't know necessarily if this number is much different from the normal number, right? Eclampsia, which is basically an acceleration of high blood pressure and a couple other things that happen during pregnancy, 1%. Look at the premature label. 9%. So when you, when you think about 9% as a premature labor, that's actually a pretty good number when you think about it, especially in a young population, right? Um, acute anemic event, so at 3%, look at the maternal mortality, 0.4%, percent all right? This basically is approaching the normal population. And so this is data, so Dr. Knowles was talking about data with small studies, but this is data over 445 pregnancies over a long period of time, okay? 19 centers in the world cooperated with this. All right, so you can pretty much feel reasonably assured this is the real deal. So the next time you go to your obstetrician and he says, ah, you have sickle cell, I don't know, you just go, maybe you need to call Dr. Tranquist or call one of the hematologists. They can update you because didn't you go to medical school in the 1980s? And then, you know, no disrespect, but things have changed, okay? <laughs> All right. Now, what about the babies? So we still have a little bit of this issue with small for gestational aids and premature, but, you know, the, the you know, neonatologists have gotten really good. So I don't think this is too much of an issue anymore. And small for gestational aids, I, yeah, I don't think that's a big deal anymore. All right. So, what are the recommendations now if you want to get pregnant in 2016? Call a hematologist first, early, not when, you, you know, when you're thinking about it, okay? Because he's probably going to need to talk to your obstetrician and say, all right, this is okay, all right? We'll, we'll be okay with this. So, we can identify high-risk patients um, early, okay? So, what do I mean high-risk patients? So, somebody's had two or three miscarriages already, that's somebody we would say, huh, we may consider doing a prophylactic transfusion. And, and those, so those would be people we'd consider actually doing transfusions. Um, people who already have evidence of organ damage. People, you know, who have, you know, kidney problems, you know, things that would make them have difficulties. Interestingly, the, the biggest hurdle that we run into when people want to get pregnant is if you can get somebody through that first trimester, then they're good, all right? And so for us, that's the biggest, that's the hardest part. Let's get them through that first trimester, all right? So there's lots of things that we can do, all right? Now, you have to stop the hydrea, okay? Hydrea is pretty much is gonna be in the water for most sicklers eventually because almost everybody's gonna be on hydrea eventually. That's just the way the literature is going. So you need to, so if you, going to elect to plan the pregnancy, you need to stop the hydrea at least three months before you plan to get pregnant, all right? So this whole stuff about prophylactic transfusions originally didn't show any improvement in a perinatal outcome, but it actually significantly reduced the complications, the other complications of pregnancy and also the sickle crisis, all right? So basically, we can select out patients that we're going to give transfusions to to get them through um, that period. Then, we so the hematologist's job in this is like the obstetrician's job. We got to actually follow these patients pretty closely. Um, so it's once every two weeks, and the first um, trimester once a month, and the second, you know, and then it gets closer towards delivery. And then we're going to supplement people with iron and folic acid as needed. Um, so what you'll find if you look deeper in the literature is there's a lot more um, iron deficiency than we expect, especially when women. Um, get pregnant. So actually we have to give iron transfusions and the like. Okay? And that's it.
You've been watching Doctors Hospital Distinguished Lecture Series, presented every third Thursday in the month. Thank you for joining us.